information is available. This is just a, a, a first note. Second, we have we are very flexible here. We thank you very much for being with us. The overall team is, is a big challenge. The challenge in coffee trade is a challenge to discuss here. So we have been reconsidering how to do this in the best way possible. Thank you so much. The best way is that in order to discuss this, we have a very big, high-level, distinguished speakers. And the purpose of the World Coffee Conference is to bring the best and share and discuss among us. So, first of all, thank you all for being accepted to be here. Um, I think the, 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 the uh, presenter has given you a presentation. I can give you a very quick round to tell you who we have the privilege to have with us today. Second point is that we have an overall question, and as I say, the challenge of talking about challenges of trade is very high. So there is one side, whatever is related to how the market is evolving, how the relation between different origin and different coffee, how the price volatility is impacting this. And the second one will be focusing more on how the changing regulatory framework has an influence on this. So this is the overall concept we would like to discuss. And let me just present more in detail who we have here today. So maybe um, we have an order because we divided in two groups. However, that you can see in the screens, the idea is that as we have the advantage of all, all of them here, we will ask different questions to different people. But what I promise, that we will push them to give us the solutions. I don't want only to be here and cry and complain and be sorry. What are the solutions? What action should be taken? And I also would like to know from all of you who should do what? Because then it's not just to share knowledge, but to provide solutions. Do you agree on this approach? First of all, if you agree, that's what we try to do. Third point, as this is a panel, we were discussing presentation or presentation. Ideally, we didn't need presentation. However, there's been some indication that some of the element is good to bring to the common agreement. We have a large audience with different expertise and knowledge, so we have refocused on some presentation. Now, who we have here? We have representatives from all range from uh, the, of the coffee value chain. We have representatives from traders, rosters. We have representatives from association. We have representatives from India. So we have a very rich uh, 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 range of, of expertise and knowledge. So in the list, and there is, you know, there is no specific list, but just the way they are presented here, we have, first of all, our friend Trishu Mandana is the managing director of World Cafe, so one of the leading coffee trading companies in the world. And, you know, at least, you know, a, a round of applause for him to be with us. Then we have Juan Esteban Ordus. I think from nobody doesn't know him. Everybody knows him. He's the president of the Colombia Coffee Federation. Yes. of North America, yes. You, in case you have the, the microphone to speak. Uh, then we have uh, also the privilege from uh, Unilever here. Uh, Mandip uh, Shintuli is the procurement head, but very much engaged in sustainability. And I think he has a lot of experience, a lot of way to contribute to this discussion. And again, Amit Pant, senior vice president of Tata Coffee. Tata Coffee is one of the sponsors here. We have been uh, listening to, to some of your uh, colleagues there. We have a very interesting discussion before. He has a lot of to contribute to this discussion. Thank you. Then, as I said, still in the same panel, 
uh, we have Mario Ceruti, who is from Lavazza, but he has a different hat. He's representing the European Coffee Federation, and he's the one that will be giving some highlights about one of the regulations, that's the, the one on deforestation. Okay, Mario, thank you. Ramesh, the president of the Coffee Expo Association on in India, from Bangalore, and also, you know, friends. We've been also the opportunity to have a lot of interesting discussion, and this will be sharing with you. Uh, Monsieur Anselm Gouton, uh, then is, is uh, there on, the, on my left. He's the president of, of ACRAM, who is the African uh, Madagascar Robusta Coffee Agency. Monsieur Gouton, merci, bienvenue. Uh, uh, he's going also to have some highlights on more broader change in regulation. The reason is, when we prepare for this panel, there was a, the interest not to focus on one regulation, but on changing environment. So, agrochemicals, uh, due diligence. So, there are a number of things happening in the sector. We want to understand with you why they're there, what they're for, what are the issues, how to solve them. Uh, and finally, this is on the left. <laughs> the stream left, this is uh, uh, Mike Buki. He's, he's based in India, he's from the, the European Commission, he's the head of the economic sessions here in India. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Now, as I say, the, the question, we, we wanted to start in a more general way to go then to a more specific way, uh, uh, focus on the discussion. Here, what we know that um, the challenge of coffee trade are there. Um, we want to discuss how this, the coffee value chain is, is evolving. As I say, the market in general. Of course, demand and supply are the key to determine uh, the distribution, the value, the volatility, and the governance in the supply chain. So, we know there are a number of factors affecting this. We've been also hearing here these days. One is, you know, changing the climate. We know recently how this has been always affecting. If you've been the other day, we see the evolution of prices in the coffee sector. This is a common thing for agricultural based commodities, big volatility. And of course, this has an impact on all the actors, but specifically on, on, on farmers. The second point, uh, uh, this is related to what systems are in place to manage the supply chain. And the third one is what strategy are needed to make the treaty more sustainable. Now, I will start with a round of questions. Having in mind, I say we have a large audience with different expertise. So try to be also very clear. And I, I want to start, as we discuss, from, uh, from Trishul. Please, you want to go there, you want to take the microphone, uh, you have the microphone. Give us your view about what is changing, what is happening, and what is affecting this evolution. I think it would be good to have, I think it would be good to have the questions up on the okay. board if you can. Can you put the questions? Okay, here they are. Um, it's the previous, the previous slide. I can give it to you, even okay. like this. I think it's the previous slide where we, um, you know, we talked about the coffee industry and other commodities being affected by a, a cycle of high and low price fluctuations. Is it uh, climate related and how is it uh, impacting your business or the country? How do you mitigate risk and how to help small farmers? There are lots of questions in this. Um, in my view, the two fundamental facts that are impacting coffee prices today um, is related to fluctuation of production in the world's largest producing country, which is Brazil. Um, and then you say, wh why is that happening? Uh, one would basically argue that this is climate related, theoretically, uh, bearing in mind that a lot of, uh, of Brazilian coffee is in a temperate region, but let's just say the number one reason that we are seeing fluctuations in price has to do with weather and weather in Brazil in particular. 
you can talk about whether in every other country that's producing coffee, but it is somewhat meaningless in the context of the size and scale of Brazil. So from that perspective, I would say climate and weather in Brazil is one very, very important factor. The second that factor that is impacting prices, which is happening here now and today, has to do with how roasters look at what they want to give their consumers. And so in short, if you have a situation where roasters are trying to cut cost, um, and we are seeing that here today because of the current environment, the current environment of a combination of inflation and a recessionary environment means that roasters are moving to cheaper products and the cheaper products very uh, clearly include higher robusta usage and also higher bazoo usage. And these are the two primary factors that are driving price in my mind. So it's not just climate related. Um, how is it impacting our business? Yes, it, it is impacting all of us in very different ways. Um, I think what I am most concerned about, about what I have seen in the last 12 to 18 months, we have seen prices globally over $2 in New York with very high prices, especially for washed Arabica coffees. So in my mind, the washed Arabica coffee farmer has seen a very handsome price in the last uh, 18 months or two years post a weather event in Brazil, which was, as many people know, uh, we had two frosts in a drought in Brazil. The challenge that I see is in this high price environment, we really didn't see a supply side response from the Arabica farmers, the washed Arabica farmers. So washed Arabica producer production remained constant and they didn't really take advantage of that higher price environment. Okay. And now where we are here today, Brazil in fact has reacted to that high price environment. And when you combine the higher production of Brazil with the fact that the roasters are looking to move to a cheaper product, what we have seen in the last three to four months has been an incredible shift into Robusta and to Brazil unwashed naturals. And clearly what we have seen, which is very disturbing for me, is a very significant reduction of the price of washed Arabica coffees. In my view, that's not going to change anytime soon, rather sadly. So from that point of view, yes, I have huge concerns, uh, just like I think uh, a lot of people that are in these wash producing countries, in terms of what it means for the future of these uh, countries. Um, it carries all sorts of risks for us. Uh, the bigger the production in two countries and the smaller the production in wash Arabica countries, it makes everything from our own operations to the way in which we can manage price risk in New York very, very challenging. And then finally, you know, how to help smallholder farmers, which I think what yeah. most people uh, want to hear about. Um, I won't lie, it is very, very challenging because ultimately the answer lies in the smaller holder uh, becoming significantly more efficient or receiving assistance or oh, my personal favorite theory on this is that if you, let's say, force or encourage, maybe is the better word, roasters to start using more washed Arabicas in their blends, I think that's one way in which you counter the reduction in these values. Uh, one of the theories that I've espoused more than once is if you are basically buying a shirt anywhere in, in Europe, and you, you have to basically find a label saying whether it's manufactured in India, in Colombia, or in uh, Bangladesh, whatever. Why can't roasters be obliged to actually say where and where they're sourcing their product in order to put it on the shelf? So you can well imagine if roasters are obliged to actually put that data on their packs in the shelf, it is then going to create an uncomfortable reality for them in terms of pressure, let's just say, from environmental groups.
to say, okay, why are you not buying coffee from Guatemala or Colombia or, one of the, or India? And that creates a real demand in my mind for these origins. And it's one way in which I think we can uh, see or get, achieve higher prices uh, for um, uh, achieve higher prices for wash producers. Today, I think it's pointless asking roasters to and consumers to demand more coffee. What we really need to help, in my mind, are the smallholders that are struggling in this price environment, not necessarily very efficient farmers. And we need to be very clear. And sometimes, in my mind, the world's not very clear on that uh, theory. I'll pass it on. Okay. Well. Th thank you, Trishul. I, I, I know you and I know what, uh, you know, the, 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 the focus on, on this. Now, of course, you know, we are also very by the antitrust, so we, we cannot talk about prices specifically. We have here an interesting combination who in the value chain has a different roles. And again, going back to the main theme is that, you know, there are this volatility and one way is, in the, I mean, you, you are in between the farmers and the roasters. So you have your perspective. But of course, in the boat, uh, part of the chain, they all are affected by that. So maybe uh, taking from this, uh, who would like to, and then I have a producer country, we have Colombia, and then we have number of roasters, we have the exporters. How you see, but I say, the key point is this volatility is there and depends on different factors, as you say. Some is because of the size of the different origin, by the climate, and some other factors. That, that, that's given, right? The point is how this um, combination of what kind of uh, the roster decide to blend in the coffee, it's something that uh, I don't know if you're willing to discuss. But what I mean more interested is say, what, what is with the farmers? Because they are the one, at the end of the day, they are more affected in their own life, on a daily life, about this volatility. Now, from an industry view, please, you know. Thank you, Gerard. Uh, just to add to what Trishul said, um, while he captured very well the uh, you know, the upstream risks which farmers face and intermediaries face. I will focus the next few minutes on processed coffee. coffee. Uh, a quarter of the world's trade today, and we are talking about challenges in coffee trade, yes. is soluble coffee, right? And soluble coffee by itself is exposed to all the risks that Trishul mentioned, because 60% of your cost is bean coffee, right? So the risks on price, the risks on climate, the risks on counterparties, all the possible volatilities that he spoke about, you're exposed to that. And in addition, you have a very, very dynamic regulatory environment to tackle. Okay. So if you look at the way things have changed over the last few years on, say, agrochemical residues or food safety, food hygiene, this is something which has kept the producers around the world on toes. And it adds to the challenges that you see today in the world of coffee production especially when you're a B2B producer, you are participating in the world trade, you today find that the laws change more rapidly than the capacities which are built on the ground to take care of those challenges, right? If we have a change as far as, you know, a regulation on food safety is concerned, or say residue limits change, we have to necessarily give first ample amount of time for origins and producers to see whether the capacity is there or the relevant education is there for them to come up to speed. Secondly, I mean, things like, you know, the challenge when regulation is, regulation is different for different parts of the world. So what's a specific regulation, what it might mean to you in say the European Union would not be true for other parts of the world. So a producer like us has different challenges when you address different market segments around the world. And this is something that we have been grappling with over the f past five to 10 years because the, the scene has been changing in a very, very dynamic manner, right? And I would strongly urge when you look at situations like this, we have to first build capacities on the ground before you change regulations because you do it faster than the, you know, than the producers or the origins, you always have a challenge in terms of 
keeping up. Okay. Thank you so much. I think uh, Ramesh wants to add something on that. And just, just to recap, I mean, you, you say that the changing regulatory environment is a key factor that is affecting uh, the, 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 the it's a, it's a significant challenge. Okay. Now, what, what I, you, you, I think the micro is not on. Try to. No. Okay. Well, go ahead, uh, Ramesh. I would address all no? the issues raised by Trishu. Can you hear him? No. I don't know. Mike, why don't you go there? <laughs> oh, oh, this one. Okay. <laughs> uh. oh, it's okay, it's okay. I, I, I take it. Uh, I hope I'm audible. I think there seems to be a conspiracy to silence me, but uh, anyway, I'll address both what Trishul said about price and what uh, Amit said about the agrochemicals and MRL in one. Uh, see, the price is obviously impacting the grower, but the grower has very little choice in a change. It's not the coffee is a perennial crop. You cannot just change from one crop to the other at a very short notice. It's also grown at a higher elevation where you have very little choice of what crop you can grow. But I think in India, at least, you can see that there has been a shift away from Arabica towards Robusta, which seems to be in line with what Trishul is saying over the market. So the growers are responding in a very slow manner to the uh, need for more Robusta than there is for Arabica. Now, I would hate to call it a cheaper coffee. I just say it's a different coffee because I always held that Robusta is not inferior to Arabica. I grow Robusta so, okay. and Arabica, so uh, okay, if you know both. I cannot say anything negative about Robusta. But So you see a change is coming. Now, whether it's good for the market, bad for the market, as a grower, you cannot... But the grower is hurting. What is obvious is with these changes is the grower is hurting. The second point leading further what he said, which he did not elaborate, was the concentration of production in two countries, in one or two countries, is dangerous. You saw what happened when entire manufacturing industry concentrated in one particular country. And when there's a supply shock, it goes causing a recession. So I think uh, it's not ideal that we have production concentrated in just a couple of... Uh, countries. So I think we need to look at that. Okay. The second point, and I'd like to add to what Amit said about, uh, okay, another thing which you do not want to mention was the track and trace. See, now track and trace is being applied on the grower. With the new regulations, they are saying put in track and trace so you can track from which farm it comes. But being fair to both sides, should the track and trace also not apply to the roaster? I know Mario would not agree with this. He was shaking his head vigorously when uh, Trishul said it. But that's one point. But main point I was talking about agrochemicals. Now, a farmer is forced to use agrochemicals for various reasons. In India, we use very little agrochemicals and not a big issue. But you see that in the European Union, just for an example, almost all agricultural commodities, they fix the maximum residue limit at 0 0.01 ppm or less. Now, here I would like to quote, with Mario's permission, an old uh, e ECF, European Coffee Federation uh, paper, where they mentioned glyphosate, for example. Now, glyphosate, which we all know is a herbicide, in the case of coffee, is 0 0.01 ppm. But in the case of rice, is 0.2 ppm, which is, I mean, 0.1 ppm, which is 10 times higher. So the ppm, the residue limit is permitted in rice, 10 times higher than in coffee, and 20 times higher for oat and barley. Now the consumption of coffee, as per the ECF paper, is about 30 grams. And the consumption of rice per day is 200 to 300 grams. 
So you are consuming more rice and less coffee, but the permissible limit for rice is higher than coffee. So you, that forces you to think, are we really addressing a toxicological standard or is it something else? Because if it is poisonous, it should be equally poisonous for rice or wheat. In fact, should be, the limit should be lower for rice and wheat than it is for uh, coffee. So I think the problem is that the EU standards for uh, pesticide residues, or I mean, agrochemicals, because glyphosate is not a pesticide but a herbicide, is based on hazard, not based on risk. So what you're asking for my solution, which may not be agreeable to the other panelists, but I think that all these limits should be based on uh, the uh, risk-based and not hazard-based. So the EU has openly admitted is hazard-based, whereas Codex Alimentarius, which was the standard earlier, is based on risk. So I would say that, one, the limit should be based on risk and not on hazard. The second point is that <laughs> what, again, Amit said over the frequent uh, changes. Now, if you look in uh, June, July of last year, that is in 2022, the EU changed the residue limits 50 times in 42 days. So I don't know how scientific studies could be done that you could do 50 changes in uh, 42 days. So I think that, and okay, further, I don't know how many of you are familiar with a very harmful chemical called imidacloprid. It's not used in coffee, but it was on a prohibited list till recently. Now, EU has permitted the use of imidacloprid for a temporary period, and glyphosate, despite its known harmful effects, is still not banned. So you have these frequent changes. So I think the reason they're given for not for allowing a banned chemical was that we need to wait till a suitable alternative is found. So I think that so we should not just keep changing it. We should wait. If you find something is toxicology not safe, we should give them time to uh, develop an alternative and not change the rules uh, so uh, frequently. So I'm sorry it took up a lot of time, but I shall not address the other issues. Thank you very much for your, uh, thank you very much for your clarification. Now, now let's move to the other side of the table, to also from the producer side, and then see comment. Because there are a lot of uh, issues here that we brought in. Um, so let's see what the large world producers telling us on this and their reaction. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's, it's much, much easier to speak like this. So that's why I do it. In November of 2021, you may recall that there was the meeting of the COP27, or I think it was in Glasgow, and Tom Friedman wrote a column in, uh, in uh, the New his column in the New York Times saying, I don't know, it's kind of, wants to kill you, this thing. <laughs> the, uh, the New York Times, and he used the title of a book for his column that said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And every time I think of that title, I think of what we are facing right now. The, uh, when, when Gerardo sent me the questions uh, about, the, about the, uh, the, the panel, I thought, okay, we have to talk about volatility and we have to talk about regulation. So how do those connect? So although my son claims that I have a teenage son who claims that I am old-fashioned, almost obsolete, I said, okay, I may be obsolete. There are much, there are much more smarter, much smarter people than me in this panel. Uh, so I will check with ChatGPT. I will ask the question to LGBT. So I ask the question in many forms and ways. What causes price volatility in coffee? Weather conditions, crop diseases, global supply and demand, current exchange rates, uh, geopolitical factors, market speculation, economic factors like inflation and those factors. Uh, they said it's market information, news and information that comes uh, that does, is publicly available, and environmental concerns. So now we're talking, we're connecting dots, good. So it said, growing awareness of sustainability and ethical sourcing practices can affect prices as consumers 
and companies seek co out coffee producers, coffee produced under specific environmental and social conditions. Sounds interesting. So then I said, okay, now ChatGPT gave me in many ways, forms and shapes the same answer. And then asked it in the second question in different ways. But the basic, the nutshell is how to deal with coffee price volatility. Then it said, you know, diversify suppliers. Oops, Trishul. Oops, diversify, diversify suppliers. So you don't get the Colombian, get the Honduran, get the Brazilian, get the fine. One, one, one big red flag here. Hedging, managing inventory, long-term con contracts, uh, cost control, price adjustments, consumer education, market research, and alternative ingredients also connected. Uh, alternative ingredients meaning coffee or not coffee, no, or meaning Arabica versus Robusta. So back to a conversation we had with Trishul this morning. So now we have two things, uh, and we connect the dots. So price volatility has to do with the environment, has to do with, with uh, responsible sourcing, and has to do with the regulation. Because if regulations are issued that affect, that can affect supply and can affect the situation of farmers and can prevent products to enter major markets, there will be a consequence in price. And we're talking about 25 million people the world coffee in the in the world in the live of coffee it's about it's more than 120 million people all over the world many of them here in india we're talking about 70 percent of them are uh, smallholder farmers and we're also talking about that coffee is produced between the tropics of capricorn and cancer which is the most where most of the climate change is happening so i thought it's kind of funny that developed world wants to fight climate change by punishing people who are in the most affected area of climate change. So again, who's paying the bill? Of course, the farmers. Uh, this, was, this was one of the, of, the, of the conclusion. And then I had the dots completely connected. I said, you know, Gerardo is a genius. He just gave us two apparently unrelated questions that are completely connected. And that's a big concern that we have and let me, I, I will not go into what, what the, the uh, we're talking about there, the deforestation regulation of Europe, but there are many other regulations and, and many others will come. The question is what to do with that and how to deal with that. And I'm going to propose a solution in the end, which is what you want us to do. Or one, I'm going to have a little proposal, but, but, uh, but let me ask you a question. What happens? Assume that each of you is a coffee farmer. Our CEO, Herman Bamon, he is a coffee farmer himself. And you get... And for some reason, you cannot get certified for deforestation. So your coffee cannot go into the EU. And, uh, and uh, your major main customer is the EU. So what do you do? You can do, I guess, two things. You can switch products and maybe uh, uh, turn down the, the uh, coffee trees and put cattle, which is going to have an even worse consequence on the environment than was intended. Or maybe you will sell your coffee very cheap to another market. So you will go to you know, some, some place, not the US. As, let's, say the, the U, let's say the US. So, and this is something we discussed with Trisha. Trisha the one who, I'm gonna give you the credit for this. He's the one who brought this up. He said, if I'm an Ethiopian farmer and my coffee cannot go to Europe, which is my main, my main market, what do I do? I will sell it very cheap in the US. What's gonna, what's, what, what's going to, what is that going to do if that happens in a massive way? That's going to take down prices for everybody, including Colombians. And this is not the issue about, about Africans versus Latin Americans and so on, but this is a situation that is very concerning. We're all very happy with saving the environment. Is the Americans have a saying, which, which I, I, always, I always use, which is that saving the forest is motherhood and apple pie. No one can be against it. No one. The question is not if we're going to do it, the question is how? How do, would, can we make sure that we, or the, how can Europe make sure, and, 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 the, and, and we as a, as, a, as a coffee value chain, that we protect the environment, we make sure there's no more deforestation, but is that gonna happen at the expense of the farmers? At the expense of ruining the farmers? 
how is that proposition going to work out? I understand there's a good, a good intention. I know that the European Union is working on how to implement this. Uh, if you ask me, from what I have gathered, talking to a lot of people in Europe and in the coffee market and so on, they have no clue yet. Uh, not because they are not capable of having of, of doing it, but because it's a difficult uh, task, and you have to spend more time on the ground and seeing what's what's happening in the farms, what hap what's happening in producing countries. That is very important. So. At this point, we have a legislation from the Euro uh, European Parliament. We have a regulation that says what has to be done. We don't know exactly how it has to be done and what the consequences will be. And we're just, we're less than a year and a half away. And for all of you who are in the coffee value chain, this is nothing. This is two seconds. We're less than one and a half years away from the legislation to be in place. So how are we going to deal with this? It's going to be very difficult. So my, what we've been saying, what my proposal is, we need to get the European Union to have like a buffer period for this to be seriously thought, seriously, that, that the implementation has to be thought in a much serious manner. Producing countries, I mean, they, they get closer to producing countries, see what happens on the ground and what's feasible and what is not. And after that, we can apply the, the legislation. Because if not, yeah, I, I'm going to quote uh, uh, half partially uh, 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 Tom Friedman away. In this case, everybody will want to go to heaven, but someone else is going to have to die. So my recommendation is, let's be serious about this, give some time, and uh, let's, this, let's give producers time to adapt to the adaptation. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Well, first of all, I think we all want to eat the, the apple pie, but not all together, otherwise it will get sick, so we have to be careful on that. But bef before I give the, the because I, I think uh, uh, Pradeep wanted to say something, if, you, if I allow, and, and, and I think it's, I want to give the opportunity to everybody to speak. Uh, of course, also you have to make sure that I, you know, when I eat, that there is some regulatory elements in that because you can eat, you know, ten apple pie and get sick. So also, I think your your, your parents try to educate you to eat properly. So that is also an element to be considered. But Pradeep, please. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. So first of all, uh, thanks for um, having us here, and uh, I must compliment uh, Juan for doing the. Chat GPT uh, suggestions uh, on price volatility and and by the way I think it's all right so that we must uh, also complement the research behind Chat GPT most of what is said is uh, is absolutely right so coming uh, to the issue of the uh, price volatility and I think uh, Trishul uh, really touched upon it beautifully when he uh, basically started to talk about uh, the supply issues and uh, I think it's indeed correct that a lot of what is to do with price volatility today is in relation to the uh, to the availability and we are seeing it we are observing it uh, and I think the main important point of, I would not like to repeat what the others have said but the main important point is that it's it's here and now it's no longer an issue on resilience which is going to happen say a few years from now we are clearly observing it in uh, in all the agri commodities in which we play that this is impacting us here and now and we need to really address uh, the challenges behind it so I would just like to sort of give a few examples because a lot has been said about uh, coffee, but uh, what uh, we do in tea, uh, we, we started uh, close to around uh, 10 years uh, back when we uh, founded the trusty uh, code uh, uh, along with several other uh, uh, suppliers as well as consumers. And we basically uh, have been doing a lot of work to improve the sustainability uh, in the uh, in the tea plantations in Assam, West Bengal, and South India. So what we have been able to do is that uh, we have been able to get the industry to almost 65% uh, 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 certification, and it's it's very important because it really sets the tone for what uh, uh, is there to come, and uh, it's it's important that because it addresses the concerns around the transparency, it addresses the concerns around the availability and it's a lot about smallholders because if you see the even in tea it's quite uh, similar uh, close around 50 percent of the production in tea is happening from the smallholders and we really need to make sure that the yields which they are getting are, are improving so we have been working on a 
number of projects uh, to improve the yields of the, uh, the smallholders there. Uh, and we have got some very good results. So I think that's something which we really must continue to uh, do, continue to drive, continue to support them with all the technological expertise which all the big companies have. Because I think that's the only way. So once we get that corrected, it's, uh, it's very, very clear that we'll be able to solve all these um, uh, availability issues. The other thing I think which is also important is the different yields. Uh, because if you compare the yields across the various producing countries uh, in coffee, you'll find that there is a lot of uh, variations and fluctuations which happen. And I think it's all about benchmarking, learning from the best practices in the uh, various producing countries. And if we can really equalize the yields across the various countries, I think that gives a tremendous opportunity for us uh, to improve upon the, up, upon the supply situation. And this can be an, indeed a low-hanging fruit which is, uh, which is there. So these are some of the points which I wanted to talk about, especially to improve the availability because it was going to have a direct correlation on the price volatility. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, just I'm trying to reorganize this. Now, you want threshold. I think you wanted to comment something. Uh, and, I, and I'm trying I, to I just want to pick up on... Uh, I just wanted to pick up on what uh, Juan Esteban... Uh, I can't hear you. <laughs> Hello? Go ahead. Um, you know, when I started my initial uh, comments, I said two things really impact the world uh, in terms of coffee prices. One was what happens in Brazil, and the other was how roasters basically may change their consumption patterns with more with more robustness, for example. Um, Juan Esteban touched on the third thing, which I just want to point out, this is something that has been enacted, but the impact on prices are, in my opinion, yet to be felt. And for that audience that's here in India, it's quite, uh, you know, I found it quite surprising. This topic of EUDR, which is regulation, is still not very well understood by the audience. And I made a comment in Switzerland last uh, week when I was talking at a panel to say that EUDR, whilst it's been, and it's like you described it as uh, apple pie, it's who can argue about not basically addressing the topic of deforestation. This is noble. But at the same point, I don't think the policy makers have fully understood the impact on the smallholder. And the comment I made in Switzerland was I think this could be potentially catastrophic for the small producer. And why I mean it can be catastrophic is if the producer doesn't get prepared, the governments or the origins don't help the origin get prepared, the traders basically don't have support to make sure that they're preparing the origin it could lead to a very significant decline in the value of those coffees as they struggle to find markets outside of Europe. Europe does consume 30% of the world's, or more than 30% of the world's coffee. I haven't looked at the latest Indian statistics, but it is, I think, more than 50%. So you can well imagine that if India is not prepared, uh, given our Indian uh, audience here, it can have a pretty devastating impact on the differential. So this, I'm saying, is something that's in the future yet to come, and it's something that, you know, everyone needs to be very well prepared for. Prepare for that. And I second the comments of uh, Juan Esteban, where the policymakers have reacted to pressure from their constituents to enact legislation, but unfortunately the same policymakers haven't fully understood the implication on some of the poorest people in the coffee chain. And my biggest fear is that it will dramatically impact the poorest people in the coffee chain and put them out of business if we are not careful. So I would call upon the authorities uh, in this particular case here in India, the coffee board, and of course in all of the origin countries which are perhaps maybe ignoring EUDR um, and I have basically been in a few countries where I think there's some combination of either disbelief or this will not happen or how are we going to do it. The reality is that legislation has been enacted. That ship has sailed. So now the, then the question is, 
Should these origin countries be helping their farmers? Should these origin countries be putting funds to basically help the farmers? How do we actually collect the data? How can we collect the data efficiently? Because you can well imagine if you have a country where it's very expensive to map all the farmers, that again puts it at a disadvantage to a large country that's able to collect the data very easily. So okay. in short, um, this needs to happen at the origin countries, and I, I would agree with Juan Esteban. I think European policymakers need to understand the impact on the poorest farmers and then also help them prepare getting ready for this legis legislation, not just say, okay, it's a, you know, this is it, you deal with it, not understanding the consequences on the small producer. Okay. Th thank you so much. Now, as we are saying, we are trying to uh, uh, provide... Uh, uh, now, I, th I think it's, it's becoming clear what, what are the issues. We have an advantage because some of the presenters, the, of the speakers here have some more highlight on that to go into the more the specific about the regulations. Also because hey, we have a large audience, so they may be fully aware or not of the details. Now, you brought a number of them. So while we were discussing, the idea is we ask Monsieur, uh, Monsieur Gouton, who can give us, a, let's say, an highlights of the changing regulatory framework, so in a broader term, and then we have the European Coffee Federations, who is, you know, is a party in this. It's not the regulator, but it's also the industry that is affected from upstream of the value chain. So ECF, we will see from their point of view how they see the regulation. And then we start to go to dive down to see what are the key elements that you already described and the solutions are very much related. Also because, I say, it, it, it is a broad audience that we wanted to go that. If you agree, then we can ask Monsieur Gouton. Uh, uh, I think he will del he, the presentation is in English, yes, and, uh, but he will speak in French. So if you, have, if you need, take your own uh, uh, your, the, uh, your device. Uh, as I say, we have both, you know, the very brilliant. You have the slides in English. Vous avez le, la présentation en français. Voici. Alors. Est-ce que vous le voulez le faire ou je le fais moi-même pour changer le, le, le slide Ok. Bien, merci. Okay. You know that it's very easy for me to, to make my intervention in um, French. They tell me that you uh, have many, many interpretation and main language. Bien, bien, merci, Monsieur Patakodé. Je vous, je vous la pour vous aider. La, je vous donne la parole là, à ce stade de nos, de nos interventions. Donc, comme je l'ai dit justement, je ferai ma présentation en français. Donc, je demanderai à ceux qui ne sont pas bilingues de prendre leur casque pour mieux comprendre ce que je vais faire comme présentation. Donc, il s'agit bien entendu de l'impact de l'évolution du cadre réglementaire et des obstacles au commerce mondial du café. C'est bien. Excusez-moi, mais il faut le mettre là. Ah, bon, d'accord. <rire> Monsieur Sigrant, aussi, Pardon. Bien, alors, donc, en fait, euh, le plan de l'exposé serait tout simple. Hein. Donc, dans un premier temps, je parlais de l'évolution, bien entendu, du cadre réglementaire et des défis subséquents. Et ensuite, dans un deuxième temps, Je ferai des propositions pour vous permettre d'être très à l'aise sur ce que je vais présenter. Si, bien entendu, M. Pataconi me, me le permet, parce que certainement qu'il va me poser cette question, j'aimerais anticiper déjà sur euh, la réponse. Donc, euh, comme vous le savez, le mets slide. Donc, comme vous le savez, justement, bon, le café vraiment reste encore un produit de grande spéculation. Nous sommes conscients justement de l'importance économique de ce café, mais je prendrai plutôt l'aspect qui relève de nos producteurs, qui sont extrêmement dépendants de ce produit, qui occupe une place prépondérante sur le marché international. Nous connaissons bien entendu tout ce que ça rapporte euh, aux pays importateurs, mais au détriment, permettez-moi de le dire, au détriment des pays euh, exportateurs. Donc, euh, 
malheureusement encore, on se retrouve confronté à l'évolution d'un cadre réglementaire qui, se, qui est tellement contraignant euh, pour euh, nos pays exploitateurs, dont les pays producteurs. Et ces obstacles euh, sont nécessairement, euh, ont nécessairement un impact non négligeable, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, sur le commerce mondial du café. Je vous parlerai dans un premier temps de l'évolution alors de ce cadre réglementaire et des défis subséquents. Donc, euh, la réglementation sur la sécurité sanitaire du café, évidemment, défi de s'assurer de la qualité et de l'inocuité du café, respect des normes de sécurité alimentaire, respect, bien entendu, aussi des limites maximales de, contam de contaminants, respect aussi des normes sanitaires et phytosanitaires. Il y a aussi le défi de traçabilité, qui est aussi un aspect qui fragilise encore beaucoup plus nos, nos producteurs au détriment des pays euh, qu'on qu appelle pays consommateurs, qui, bien entendu, tuent l'essentiel de la traçabilité euh, dès que le produit arrive, comment dirais-je, à leur niveau. Donc, euh, en fait, il s'agit de mettre en place des systèmes pour limiter, euh, voire éliminer les risques de contamination, l'existence des bonnes pratiques d'hygiène et des bonnes pratiques aussi agricoles. Donc, euh, dans un deuxième temps, nous parlerons bien entendu de la réglementation sur la sécurité environnementale et phytosanitaire. Ceux qui m'ont précédé ont abordé euh, de long en large cet aspect environnemental et phytosanitaire sur comment les, les produits que nous, euh, que nous transformons, bien entendu. Donc, il y a la protection du café contre l'entrée le, contre et la propagation des maladies des caféiers et des ravageurs. Nous avons aussi également la mise en place des systèmes d'analyse et de risque sanitaire afin de déterminer le niveau de risque il s'agit de livrer ce certificat phytosanitaire pour les lots à, euh, à exporter. Donc, euh, la réglementation sur les aspects sociaux et les conditions de travail, c'est aussi un aspect qui est déterminant aussi dans... Euh, dans tout le itinéraire technique de la production et de la transformation. Donc, il s'agit de la santé et la sécurité des travailleurs, le droit des travailleurs, le travail des enfants et l'importance de l'école, logement et conditions, bien entendu, de vie. Et aussi, il s'agit de la discrimination, etc. Mais il y a des défis à relever et ces défis sont assez encore contraignants. C'est la nécessité de contrôle de, de qualité avant exploitation pour bénéficier de sur côte sur, la, sur le café et la nécessité également d'assurer un meilleur suivi des statistiques d'exploitation du café en améliorant le système de collecte et de traitement de, de données. Cette nécessité de suivi aussi du respect des prix fixés pour éviter la surenchère. Également la garantie de financement producteurs et leur organisation acheteurs et bien entendu exploitateurs. La nécessité d'une meilleure compréhension du marché à terme, marché physique par les acteurs de la filière, surtout les petits producteurs. Vous voyez, après avoir listé toutes ces contraintes, vous comprendrez à quel point aujourd'hui, vivre du café devient un véritable problème pour, bien entendu, nos producteurs et même nos transformateurs à la base. Nous avons des propositions, bien entendu, à faire pour les besoins. Euh, de la situation afin de surmonter les obstacles au commerce du café. Mais vu du côté, bien entendu, de ces, de ces petits producteurs que sont euh, les producteurs africains. Ces propositions sont les suivantes. Nous avons deux propositions. La première proposition, il s'agit de renforcer la coopération entre euh, les acteurs pour une production plus vertueuse du café. Et la deuxième proposition, c'est l'instaurer avec nos partenaires commerciaux un cadre inclusif du dialogue. Donc, pour la première proposition, comme je l'ai dit au début, de, au début de ma présentation, il s'agit de renforcer la coopération entre acteurs pour une production plus vertueuse du café, afin notamment d'améliorer les programmes de recherche et les implémenter dans les pays producteurs, d'améliorer la productivité grâce à l'utilisation d'un meilleur matériel végétal adapté, d'introduire des techniques et des technologies toujours plus adaptées de lutte contre les principaux bioagresseurs des vergers et des productions. Accompagner aussi, bien entendu, les acteurs à la mise en place 
des modèles durables de production et de consommation à travers l'économie circulaire. La deuxième proposition, bien entendu, euh, comme je l'ai dit au début, c'est d'instaurer avec nos partenaires commerciaux, notamment l'Union européenne, un cadre in inclusif de dialogue. Donc, euh, il s'agit pour nous, comme on l'a fait pour le, pour le cacao, de mettre en place, si possible, des coffee talks avec la, com la Commission européenne, à l'instar, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, du cacao, qui se tiennent depuis trois ans pour, la filière, pour cette filière cacao. Donc, c'est un aspect essentiel pour permettre certainement de commencer à avoir un début de solution à la problématique causée par euh, la situation que connaît actuellement le café et, les, et la réglementation sur le café. Donc, nous pourrons aborder ainsi nos partenaires commerciaux euh, avec les préoccupations cruciales que sont, entre autres, la déforestation. C'est un débat maintenant qui, fait, qui, 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 qui continue à faire couler beaucoup d'encre mais pour l'instant, qui reste encore assez flou, et, y compris, bien entendu, la protection de l'environnement. Il y a aussi les questions euh, sanitaires et phytosanitaires et les limites maxi des résidus. Il y a aussi le travail des enfants. Bon, c'est toujours un débat qui continue. Et il y a, bien entendu, aussi l'argumentation douanière. Euh, je dirais en conclusion, si le modérateur me le permet, euh, le café demeure un produit important, nous le savons dans le commerce mondial, pour les économies de nos pays et pour nos planteurs. Nous avons des économies en développement, bien entendu, et il s'agit pour nous de mettre en place des cadres de travail communs entre producteurs et, entre producteurs et consommateurs, et également de permettre de prendre en compte les préoccupations de chaque acteur de la chaîne de valeur afin de mieux gérer le complexe de la chaîne d'approvisionnement de cette filière. Les différentes actions que nous préconisons dans ce bref exposé ont pour seul objectif de rendre plus fluides les interactions en toutes les parties prenantes pour une filière durable et assurer la durabilité de la dite filière. Euh, C'est des éléments essentiels pour nous pour pouvoir assurer, bien entendu, la durabilité dans ce secteur d'activité et permettre à ce que, si ces conditions sont réunies, que nous puissions, et beaucoup de prédécesseurs, de ceux qui m'ont présenté, présenté l'ont rappelé, et veiller à créer un cadre favorable pour euh, un revenu décent pour nos producteurs. Parce que ce débat, ce débat continue en ce moment. Et si nous ne trouvons pas une solution appropriée face à toute cette réglementation, à toute réglementation nous allons progressivement tuer la production à l'origine. Je vous remercie. Merci. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Gouton, merci. Um, it, it was a broader uh, point. Now, I think we can jump directly to Mario, who has been very silent. I kept him quiet, <laughs> but he's a friend, so I can do this. We go now <laughs> deeper on one of those that, uh, as you see, was also the core of the discussion. Mario, I, yes. I believe that yes, they will should put, be put there yes. and... Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, let me just uh, um, uh, frame the, my intervention as, uh, as being uh, said by, by, by uh, our, uh, our friend. I'm here representing the European Coffee Federation, so everything that uh, I'm going to say is not necessarily my own uh, opinion. Uh, but uh, the fundamental idea was, uh, talking about the regulation, of course, was really to uh, inform everybody with, uh, you know, more or less uh, a relatively detailed uh, uh, framework in order to have everybody the same uh, information and being able to discuss on that, avoiding uh, misunderstanding or misconception. But before to do, to, to, to do that, I just wanted, uh, with uh, all the other hats I have, and sorry, Gerardo, for this, but I really want to comment on a couple of, uh, of points because there are, there are things that from the Econometric and economic point of view are actually very interesting. All this uh, debate about prices, about volatility, is technically very interesting. Uh, but uh, it's very important to settle, uh, you know, the terminology and few other stuff. So, for example, just to set one: Are we talking about volatility, as we everybody was saying volatility, volatility, or 
are we talking about price level? It's slightly different. So if we're talking about volatility, maybe we can all agree that 100% uh, of us agree on 100 cents per pound. Do we agree? Maybe not. So maybe we are talking about price level, which is okay, no problem, but it's simply to have a, a termino, a, a, you know, terminologies. Another question, we, in the last two, three years, we, we had uh, the international level of prices that went from one to three and then back to two, more or less. And unfortunately, uh, we didn't really see the same uh, relationship at the producer level. So this maybe is a question, why? Why is it not happening? Why the growers are not getting the signal that the market is telling them, or maybe it's more proper to say why the growers are only getting the, the, the bad signals, the signal that we are in overproduction, so the prices are low. Maybe there is some asymmetry of information. Maybe there is some uh, lack of transparency. We should ask also this question to all of us. And last point I wanted to make about uh, changes in blend. Changes in blend are good. The whole the story is that uh, the roasters are lowering the price of blend, etc., etc. Okay, I want to discuss that. Fine, but uh, please consider that uh, the majority of the choices are done by the final consumer. So, in an environment uh, where you might have uh, a, 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 an economical. Uh, crisis moment, for example, as we have in Europe or in particular in Italy, in, a, in, in, the term, in, in particular situation, the consumer may want to spend less or in, in, a, in a situation of increases costs and prices, he might want not to spend the additional amount of money. So the only thing he can do is or reduce consumption. So I'm getting three coffee a day. Tomorrow I will get two. So I can... Uh, you know, finance the, the price increase with lower consumption, or the other thing they can do is to lower, let's say, the quality, but certainly the, the, the pricing of my product. And so in that case, if you, if you work on that, on the components of a blend, in terms of Arabic or Basta specific qualities, you have an impact and you have a change. And this is the final consumer making the change. And if we don't consider that, Again, I'm simply saying these things because we are making a discussion that, to say the least, is not, uh, uh, let's say, sophisticated as, as it should be. Oh, having said that, I'm sorry, I really apologize with, with you, but... You are Yeah, no, <laughs> I don't want to abuse, but uh, again, now uh, let's go back to the regulation. As I said, let's try to, 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 to explain uh, uh, as, as, as much as and uh, the best I can uh, the, the regulation. So. Let's, uh, let's go, Gerardo, please. Oh, so yeah, uh, thank you. So, well, first the slide was uh, about who is uh, ECF, very quick one. ECF uh, is the association representing the European industry, et cetera, et cetera, all the countries, uh, all the big companies, et cetera, but also the very fragmented sector that, that we have in Europe with hundreds and hundreds, uh, hundreds of, uh, of roasters, uh, traders, uh, and various uh, operators in the coffee sector. Uh, this is uh, the extract of the European uh, official journal, journal where the, uh, in, in uh, 31st of May was uh, the regulation approved and published on the official journal. So, in, in Europe, that means that this is a law, is effective, and it just happened that the law says that uh, it will be uh, applied uh, as of 1st of uh, January 2025. So this is the, 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 the starting point, just a precision, just again, just to be, to be precise. In Europe, this is also good for exports. So if you have to, that means that the 1st of January, you export one kilo of coffee and you enter into this regulation. So to export the coffee the 1st of January, you have, of course, to produce it, to roast it, maybe December, maybe November. And if you roast the coffee in, uh, say, November, you should have uh, bought it uh, a little bit earlier and certainly shipped not later than September, October. So basically, we are at one year from, from now or less than one year from now unfortunately, <laughs> but this is, this is the case. So, 
Another, another point that we have to bear in mind, and this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, a favor, something that has been forgotten, but is a favor of the European Commission to the countries that have uh, a certain uh, capacity in producing coffee. So that was a comment I was making already in, in May in Brazil. Here, I think, is uh, also valid. Uh, it's a favor also to India that has an important capacity of making uh, uh, soluble coffee because the soluble coffee will enter straight forward in Europe without any problem is not part of the re regulation. The timeline is this one, I already anticipated, so 30th of December, 1st of January 25, it starts. Uh, there is a small parenthesis for the uh, small and medium enterprises, you, they will uh, have six months uh, more. It's not really too much, but it's a small uh, advantage for, for the company that have six months more to get, uh, to get uh, let's say, um, ready for, for the regulation. If you consider that uh, the same as medium more companies have to buy the coffee, most likely, at least the medium one, from the more or less the same channels of, uh, of supply, in reality, uh, I'm not really sure that they can really take advantage of this uh, six months uh, additional uh, timing. Now, what is uh, the essence of the, of the regulation? The UDR says that uh, coffee produced on areas that have been deforested after the uh, 30, 31, 31st uh, December 2020 will not be able to enter into the country, to Europe. And of course, the other requirement is that the coffee has been produced following the regulation of the producing countries. This is, in a way, normal in terms of human rights and labor rights. There will be new directives, specific directives, directives on human rights, child labor, etc., etc., that will will come in the next few months, but still, in any case, already, already there. And this is based on a due diligence statement. So basically, it's a declaration that the importer of, of the coffee we'll have to do at the moment of importing it. Uh, I'm not really sure if it is the same in all Europe, but at least uh, in Italy, this declaration uh, is something that we already do for other, uh, for other aspects of the import, has to be done at the import moment from the importer uh, to uh, an authority that it can be either the customs or in Italy, most likely there will be uh, the, the sanitary uh, police. Uh, the interesting part of the story is that this is automatically a penal offense if it is not uh, a, a real one. So I don't know if in other part of the Europe it's uh, an administrative uh, case, but in, in Italy is a penal one, which is a little bit more serious, of course. So the declaration should say that, of course, uh, you know the, the, well, you know yourself, of course, but you also know the coordinates, the point or the, uh, the points for, uh, for, the, um, for the polygon of uh, the location where the coffee comes from. And, and the declaration is that uh, uh, basically all these uh, factors are, are there and you, the operator, have, uh, have done everything to, to follow that. The due diligence, uh, you, you can see here, I don't really want to to, to read all of that, but I just want to introduce the concept of risk analysis. There will be two groups of countries. At this moment, we don't know which ones are in, in one group or the other one, but there will be two groups. One is the group uh, that is basically with all the countries, and the due diligence, the statement has to be done for everybody, etc., etc. But then there will be one group that is considered with additional uh, risk, and there the, let's say, percentage of control, the statistics and the requirements are higher than uh, the second group, which is the low risk countries that will have uh, a little bit more easy, uh, let's say, procedure uh, to, to, to follow. Now, let's uh, just uh, quickly stay on this issue of the geolocalization. Geolocalization per se, is not really a, a, an incredibly complex uh, issue. 
is a question of having either one point or a number of points that, uh, you know, create a polygon. It's a technical issue, but I'd say more or less today, almost everybody with a relatively simple app can, uh, can do that uh, even for free in, uh, in with, a, with, a, with a telephone, uh, with, a, with a smartphone. Having said that, and, and again, there is a lot of debate about the point or uh, the, the, the polygons, but it's not really so relevant, I think, at this, uh, at this stage. What is important is that once we know the point uh, where the coffee comes from, then basically you can confront two pictures, satellite pictures, and in a way, I said in quote, it's easy to say that uh, maybe I have a picture of uh, mm, 31st of morning, 31st of December 20 morning, and there was a lot of uh, trees and a big forest in that particular point or polygon, and then I have a picture of yesterday, and it's completely uh, deforested. Now, if the coffee comes from that area, of course, will not be able to enter in, uh, in Europe, etc., etc. Of course, there are technical issues as well, because uh, the, the, the satellite pictures are not always the same. You have uh, pictures with uh, 10 meters, uh, uh, let's say, um, precision, or 20 meters precision, or 3 meters precision. And I would argue that maybe there are some military uh, satellites that can probably see uh, your, uh, you know, the color of your eyes <laughs> from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the space. So, of course, uh, a, a much, much smaller sensitivity. Uh, there is a, an issue of interpretation of this picture. What is uh, the cutting or not the cutting? What is the definition of a, of a forest, by the way, which is not uh, such a, let's say, a quiet uh, concept. So there are a lot of technical issues. But uh, one thing that I really want to underline uh, is, is not really to be, let's say, diverted, not to divert our attention to technical issues that in one way, we all hope that uh, sooner or later it will be improved, it will be solved, it will be more perfect. As I said, uh, uh, making the, the, the joke on, on, the, on the satellite precision, that is uh, something that is already on, on its way, uh, as well as the artificial intelligence for the interpretation of the data, etc., etc. But here the point, in my opinion, is really the, the, the weak point is really the connection of this data with the coffee, with the parcel, with the grower, and the information. So the point is that all this, uh, let's say, situation should be linked and carry on with uh, the, the product. So in my opinion, the really delicate point is traceability, not necessarily all the others. And my point, I would argue that if we don't have a very good system of traceability that has to also to be democratic, there, there are some, the need of other characteristics, not just technically valid, we cannot really uh, accomplish uh, the, what the regulation, what, uh, what, uh, what the law would, uh, would, would wish. So European uh, Commission uh, worked uh, with, uh, with the European Space Agency. Uh, because, of course, those are the European experts on satellite. The problem is that the USPA is not necessarily the most uh, expert uh, uh, group of, uh, of people about traceability, about uh, uh, data management, etc. So uh, they are also struggling a little bit with a lot of, uh, let's say, good uh, capability and, and good intention, but they don't have a pre uh, say, pre-digested solution. So they are working on that. We, as the European Confederation, we are also working with them. There have been already few workshops and few occasions, but uh, we are in the process of and not really at the end of, uh, of the story. Uh, here is, is where we are. There is uh, another interesting development, which is uh, this deforestation map. As I said before, it's a technical issue, but of course is also important. And uh, one of the last uh, uh, development uh, is that uh, the European uh, Commission asked uh, JRC, is, uh, the Joint Research Center, which is a center for research for 
the European uh, community, for the European Commission, uh, to get involved into the uh, definition and the management of the deforestation map. So they are the one that uh, should produce the map uh, at different uh, timing of uh, what is uh, considered deforested, what is not, and how it was uh, in the passage of time. And so therefore, to be able by confronting two maps to say yes has been deforested or no has not been deforested. Uh, the, um, the EU participated in, into this uh, platform. I think uh, this is something as uh, has been said before. We, we, we all agree and we all think that is a very important uh, and very positive uh, action to do. Now, I, this is a little too complex. I don't want to, to enter into that, but uh, just a, a list of uh, pending things, uh, which in a way we can consider also the next developments that, uh, that will come. The, one of the, uh, the issues is really to have, uh, uh, well, the whole management of the information starting from uh, the grower up to, to the end. Uh, just to remember all of us, uh, uh, we have an incredible problem of definitions. There is not a common definition uh, about uh, the existing uh, systems. So, in principle, a grower is that in one case and something else in another one. So imagine from the point of view of somebody at the end of the chain that should put the information together and maybe add all the information without uh, any form of, uh, of uh, coherence. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit complex. Uh, so definition is, is not there. Um, well, of course, benchmarking is, uh, is a corollary situation because if we don't have a common definition, also the benchmarking is a bit, uh, is a bit weak. We are lacking the guidelines that uh, you should uh, publish, so the accompanying measure, guideline, and also, uh, let's say, the financing of, uh, of the implementation of this activity has been uh, promised, but uh, not yet uh, uh, public. Uh, so it will come. Um, there is, a, let's say, in the process, in the, in the legislation, a review that will come uh, in the next two, three years uh, to adjust uh, more or less, uh, say, small and not so small issues, for example, the soluble uh, uh, situation, uh, that will, will come uh, later on uh, in order to fix uh, a little bit uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole system. Uh, other commodities will be, will be uh, adjunted, so there will be more uh, impact in other commodities. This is important because if today uh, some of us uh, works also in other products, other commodities, um, forget uh, to, to, to think that you are out of the system. It's just a question of, of timing. It will be tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, whenever it is, it will come. And, uh, the last one is the one that I was already uh, pointing, that is uh, the involvement of the Joint Research Center, which I think is a very important uh, step uh, in order to have uh, a clear and, uh, let's say, stable uh, situation, at least uh, not to open endless discussion on what is the good map, what is not the good one, uh, 10 meters, uh, no 5 meters, no 3, uh, whatever. Okay, so this is it. Uh, this is our address. If you need uh, anything, feel free to contact uh, our secretary. We will be very happy to cooperate with all of you, as, uh, of course, we are uh, to do the same with uh, the uh, European authorities. Thank you very much. I think... Okay. Uh, one comment, but very quick, because I want to give uh, to, to Michel from the European Commission Hello. to uh, tell us something. Not working? Can you hear me? Okay. No, I just, I just had a, a comment because whenever I hear some, some things, uh, 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 I get nervous. Uh, when prices go up to some extent for farmers, the uh, other players in the value chain tend to say, farmers didn't listen didn't see the signals. They were making a lot of money. That happened in, in, 19, in 2020. We were having this whole conversation in, uh, in, with our team in New York. And I said, you know, let's, let's compare pairs and pairs. For those of you who have been in Colombia, we use uh, old Jeeps 
uh, to transport coffee. We call it jipa, the, what they, whatever a jeep can carry is called a jipao, an old jeep, 1950s, 1960s. The equivalent in 2020 was, was a basic jeep called the jeep CJ7. The average price in 1982, when the ICA was renewed until its end in 1989, 1982 was about 130 a pound. The average price per pound in September 2020 was 121. Ah, we may be comparing different moments in history and so on and so forth. Let's compare what's comparable. If you're a coffee farmer and you were to purchase a Jeep CJ7 for your farm, provided you are that prosperous you can buy a Jeep, it would cost you 8,200 pounds, the Jeep, in 1982. If you were to buy the same Jeep, in 2020, it would cost you 23,384 23, pounds, three times. So that gives you an idea of the economic situation of the farmer. Fast forward, I just made make some quick numbers here. I'm not, if you go to today, the same Jeep, today, today as in today, as in five minutes ago, is $37,000. The coffee today, Five minutes ago, 149. So the price for the farmer in, in, in uh, pounds of coffee landia, where pounds of coffee is the currency, is 24,832 pounds of coffee. So why exactly is that we should be happy when it goes to two? The 130 in 1982 was equal just by inflation, US inflation, dollars, no exchange rates, nothing, US inflation, dollars. Coffee should have been at 341 in 2020. It was in one, at 121. So it go, goes up to two. There's, it's still lagging really, really in a big uh, uh, manner behind. So, so I don't see why we should be happy with a little increase in prices for a short period of time. That's my quick comment. And then we go to the inflation. Yeah. It, no, just but, but you have to respond. We, we, we are doing a, a, a real debate, so. <laughs> But, uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm very happy. Thank you very much, because now we, we move the discussion not to volatility, which is not relevant, but to prices. Absolutely, fine. I agree. I agree. Very important. <laughs> I think be, before we enter into this discussion, I, I have, now we have to listen to, to, to Michelle from the European Commission. You, one, you want to respond to one this one? One little last comment. Yes. It's nice to want to dream of a price of 341. I can't hear but you. But if we were there, if we were there, I think the world's largest producing country, Brazil, would be wiping out everyone else. It, there's competition. It's, you know, the fact of the matter ultimately is, you know, look, why are chips basically, uh, computer chips produced in, uh, in, in Taiwan or in China? Why are clothes produced in Bangladesh? Because they're more efficient. Coffee, unfortunately, is not insulated from that. Um, I'm a big proponent of having geographic diversification. I constantly tell roasters, how many stories are you going to sell to your audience if there are only two origins left? You need to continue to invest in promoting and keeping all origins in your blend. You're selling romance and stories about different origins. It's your responsibility to have geographic divers diversification. So I keep basically promoting that idea to uh, the roasters. But in the end, you know, it's all easy, very easy for, I think, producers to ask for support. But rather sadly, you know, the reality is the higher the support, there are other countries that are more efficient. And Brazil, unfortunately, is one of them. So in my view, you know, we have talked about Brazil and how important it is. I think I want to be at pains to be clear. I admire Brazil. I admire Brazil because they are a big producer, they're efficient, and there are things in my mind to learn from Brazil. I had, did say earlier today, um, look, you know, how do we basically overcome this psych cycle where we have a situation of you know, high prices followed by very low prices. And the rea reality of why we have very low prices is because the most efficient producers tend to produce more coffee. And if you've had a price that we've had in the last two years, as I think uh, 
we basically talked about earlier, why aren't origins producing more coffee at the current price? And the, re the sad reality, I think, is you need to become more efficient. Okay. Thank you. I think it's a very good point. But now let's go back and then give the opportunity to make some clarifications on the famous apple pie and the, and the consequences of eating or not. Should. Thank you very much, Gerardo. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow panelists. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address uh, the WCC 2023 and, and in the plenary. I'm very honored. Uh, I just want to correct first that I'm not the head of the economic section, but of the sustainability section in the EU embassy in, in India. And I will therefore speak uh, as a sustainability expert and as a forester. Uh, as an agronomist and not as an economist, so please apologies for that. I also took good note of the, the question on uh, SPS, but I, I was not prepared to discuss them. I will um, uh, revert, uh, discuss with colleagues and come back to the question, but thanks for it. Uh, the, no, I, I wanted to uh, come back in particular to uh, the, the very good presentation and slides that uh, Marco presented, and, and thank you for this. Um, um, I, will, I will first uh, like to uh, underline that the requirements of the EUDR, they apply to the operators uh, who produce in Europe, uh, import to Europe or export from Europe. They are not uh, laws for uh, the producers or for the farmers, they are laws for ourselves uh, that embody the, the preference of the, of the EU consumers in a way. Uh, the second point I wanted to do is um, that um, there are no, uh, th th there is no two categories, but there are actually three categories. The, the due diligence uh, process and the benchmarking process would basically create three categories. The default category, uh, which was already mentioned, a high risk category if there was uh, a sudden increase or evidence of deforestation happening in a particular uh, geography. Uh, but also a low risk category and basically uh, in terms of implementation the main difference being that the frequency of controls uh, would go from 1% for the least risky provenance up to 9% for the most risky. So that's, that's exactly the, I mean, in practice the difference is that our member states would implement the EUDR, uh, would just apply a higher scrutiny on the, on the higher risk uh, provenance. But then the most important uh, is that the, the EUDR, uh, which is law, it is already entered into force and it will enter in application uh, on the 31st December of 2024 and then uh, it will be further fine-tuned, if you will, through a different level of, uh, of reviews, as was mentioned by, by Mario. So it's already in law, uh, but there is room for uh, as uh, Mr. Gouton put it, uh, for uh, a framework for dialogue and cooperation. And I think that, that is the most uh, urgent part because in the long run, sustainability is not an EUDR problem or an EU problem, it's a world problem. And, and it was rightly put that the problem of climate change is probably one of the biggest driver of uncertainty, uh, if not volatility as regards the production and trade of, of uh, coffee and any other productions uh, in the future. So uh, I would like to reflect a little more about uh, uh, what can be this framework of cooperation. The, the regulation itself does not demand that 100% of the farmer or even 100% of producing countries to be certified. It says that it is for the operators to document that uh, the, the commodity which is imported uh, is legal, is traceable, and has not been grown on land which has been deforested after 2020. These are the requirements. There are requirements on the operators. The means of proof, the means of evidence, is something that can be discussed uh, with the producing countries and the producer organizations. And I think, indeed, that part of the discussion is extremely urgent. Now, um, I've personally, I mean, I've, I've been posted in Asia for, for eight years, so I may have a, a, an Asian perspective that may not apply the same in other geographies. But in my mind, uh, expecting 100% certification down to the farm level uh, in, a, in a relatively short period of time is not realistic and it's not efficient. I think the verification cost associated with 100% verification at farm level could be extremely challenging. 
but that opens for consideration of other means of proof, like group certification, area-based certification, uh, jurisdictional approaches. I mean, there are a range of options that can be addressed that would allow to certify uh, larger polygons. I mean, uh, the, the regulation sets the size of the smallest polygon, four hectares, but hopefully we would have much larger polygons that would become classified as deforestation-free and therefore classified as low-risk uh, origin. So I think the reflection should really focus on what are the efficient, effective, affordable, inclusive, and pragmatic means to prove traceability, legality, uh, and, and uh, deforestation-free nature of the, of the products. And, and for that, indeed, we don't have much time. Um, if we are talking about the SMEs, it's about uh, two years or one year and a half. So we have to, we have to work diligently in that direction. And uh, my main message is that we are open for this dialogue with uh, producing country and producing organization. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I think I give you a few seconds to react, but I want to, you know, give also the, the, the our distinguished people to 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 interact. So, Trishul, be very short, please. I think maybe a question for uh, Michael. Um, I think the biggest concern we have is that the world's smallest producers are going to find it the most expensive and will take the longest time to adhere to the EU, EU DR regulation. And the likely impact, very likely and real threat, is that the prices that they get for the coffee is going to be substantially lower as European roasters are going to be forced to blend out of those coffees if they have the fear that they're going, not going to be ready. So one specific question, do you think the EU will help producing countries in their efforts to meet the deadline? And the second is, do you think they will extend the deadline once they actually understand that there could be a lot of smaller producers globally negatively impacted by this regulation. What's this? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, as regards the, uh, the need and potential for collaboration and help, uh, I think uh, it is even in the regulation itself that there needs to be platforms for such exchange and for identifying issues with uh, um, uh, demonstrating compliance for, for, all, uh, for all producers, not only the smallholders, but including the smallholders. So uh, on, on the first question, definitely yes. As regards uh, the postponement, uh, I don't think so, no, uh, for, for the, the reason that it has been in the making for a very long time. I think we've started working on ways and means for uh, Europe and other uh, to uh, slow halt and reverse deforestation for uh, more than 15 years, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong. So the, the, there will be a, uh, an implementation that will start uh, depending on the type of supplier uh, between uh, 2024 and 2020, mid 2025. So I agree it's a short window, uh, but I, I don't think uh, that the ministers and, uh, and the members of the European Parliament will revisit the, the, the deadline at such a short notice. Thank you for the clarification on these two questions about resources and timing. I would like now to give a, we don't have long time, but I think we, we have people with the microphone. Please, you know, stand up, say who you are, and make a very, very quick question, more than a comment. I was told that there are microphones coming around. Is that the case? There is one, one person there that would like to make a question. Please introduce yourself. Um. Uh, my name is Manohar. I am. Uh, I represent uh, small farmers from uh, Chikmagalur district. Uh, in a coffee chain, a farmer's role is a major role because 50% of the uh, uh, producer uh, to uh, to produce raw coffee, uh, it will take almost 50% uh, of the work. 
uh, when a coffee is sold for, uh, for example, for 100 rupees, a farmer's share will be only 4 rupees. In that, he has to maintain his estates uh, and uh, all his livelihood. It is very difficult for a farmer uh, to cultivate uh, in this uh, situation. Because of this, in India, uh, already the uh, Arabica coffee has production has come down. Question. So, what is the question? Or is a comment? Sir? So, you, you mentioned about the low price that the yeah, farmers are I blame, getting. I blame the traders. Always uh, blame on uh, frost or uh, overproduction to buy cheaper uh, coffee in a cheaper rate from farmers. So, I think the question is... Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Any other question, and then we try uh, to get an answer. Yeah, I got, a, sir, I got a question. I'm Please. Okay, okay. And, and this question is to Mr. Mandana. Um, I think the, the skew between Robusta and Arabica, we've, you know, five years back, I think, I'm a farmer from Chikmangalur, we experienced this, and it's again coming. So, I heard what you said. What I'm trying to understand is, is it taste that robust, uh, roasters are heading towards Robusta, or is it price? And if it is price, uh, you know, they say at high prices you enjoy, and at low prices you endure it. So maybe we've got to endure it for another two years. So okay. that's my question to you. Thank you. Second question. Can I just wait for a third one, and then we can, we can reply? I know this was addressed to you. The, the other one also was engaging with traders. Any other, anybody else? I can't see. Yes. Gentlemen, and then yes, we try you. to recap. Yeah. I'm Please Dr. introduce Mohan, yourself. Mohan Kumar. I'm the president of Karnataka Coffee Growers Federation. I'm representing 98% small growers. My question is, in the value chain, by traceability, is there any benefit to the producers? And the second thing is, uh, in the value chain, uh, the total ultimate uh, the profitability is very low for the producer. Uh, so how we are managing the... Is there any benefit by traceability to the producer? That is my question. Thank you. You start. <laughs> um, to answer the, the question from the gentleman at the, at the back, um, it, what we are basically seeing here is that the roasters reacting to the consumer need for a cheaper product. And essentially what is happening here is, you know, the consumer's feeling the bite, if you will, of a recessionary sort of environment. Personally, I'm finding it very um, hard to understand because I was making the comment to one of my colleagues the other day, everywhere you seem to go on holiday or every plane you seem to fly seems to be full. So why can't the consumer afford a, a decent cup of coffee is the question. And the answer that one of the roasters gave me, he says, okay. look, this modern consumer okay, you get wants to questions? spend more on uh, experiences, uh, on in other words, things. holidays, more than on a, some of his life's essentials, including a good cup of coffee. So this whole move of being driven into, uh, let's say, more robustus, I think is the reaction of the roasters catering to a client that seems to want a cheaper cup of coffee, not necessarily a better cup of coffee. My personal hope is that once we're out of that recessionary environment, that the consumer will begin to understand and taste or want a good cup of coffee again. The other thing which doesn't help is roasters tend to promote their own brands. They don't tend to promote origins. So as such, as long as that dynamic exists, the consumer doesn't really know that he needs to ask for a nice Kenya or a nice India or a nice Colombia. So that's another problem. So okay, I, I, I won't just, sorry, I'll just make a quick point. Uh, Mr. Mandana, so as of today, uh, using one's uh, point, Robusta, and this is specific to Indian farmers, 
as of today, Robusta and Arabica have pretty much reached equilibrium in price. Is that the case only in India or worldwide in Brazil? They're still catching up of Robusta to go to get an Arabica to fall down. I mean, I have seen something very bizarre, which I've not seen in my 30 year career. Um, we saw for a brief moment people or roasters paying more for robustas than the cheapest Brazil Arabicas. I think, in my opinion, that's a temporary phenomenon. Uh, it's something that is going to change. And I think, in my mind, it's not permanent. Okay, thank you. I can, can you elaborate on, on the price on the first questions as well? I think you, you go there because <laughs> the microphone doesn't work. <laughs> uh, contrary to what Trishul said, I think there is a market for robusta. Good robustas have always been popular in the uh, Italian uh, Market. So I think the Italian consumer drinks Robusta because he likes it yes. and not because it's less expensive than an Arabica. So I think the market exists for both the varieties, Arabica and uh, Robusta. We seem to forget that India produces, our production is 70% uh, Robusta and 30% Arabica. Moving on to Mohan Kumar's uh, question about uh, certification and so on. See, track and trace is here to stay, whether it is because of the roaster requiring or because of the regulations coming under EUDR. I know it adds to the cost of the uh, farmer, and usually the farmer may not be rewarded with a better price due to track and trace. But it looks like track and trace is inevitable and it is going to stay. So uh, whether you certify or don't certify, you're still, the buyer is going to insist that he can know where your coffee is. They talked about, I think Mario Arnold mentioned the geolocation of the uh, coffee. So it's all going to add to your costs. Finally, the cost gets passed down the chain. And it's unfortunate that the grower has to bear it. So, uh, you know, you don't have to go for an official certification as such. Probably in India, we can ask the coffee board to uh, create a system of uh, tracking these uh, coffees. but. I think tracking coffee is here to stay and cannot be uh, avoided. Addressing what they said about EUDR as well, if you don't yes. if you permit, you know, and adding to what Juan said about going to heaven, I think the modifying the habits saying, the road to heaven is paved with good intentions, but bad ideas. So all of us do want sustainability, we want for us, and India particularly, are very careful in protecting our forests. But the devil is always in the details. So, as he said, the law has passed. We cannot change the law. The problem is going to be in the details, but again, your issue of traceability will uh, come in. So I think, you know... Okay. Yes. I'll see you. Thank you. Oh, Michael. <laughs> so sorry. It was not... Is it working? Sorry, it, it was not at all my intention to interrupt. Um, I think you are very right uh, that uh, you can only learn by doing. Uh, and the reason I point out that we still have time is because the law has passed, but there will be something called an implementing act that will come before, of course, the, 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 the legislation uh, enters into application. And that implementing act uh, has not been uh, published yet. So there is, room, there is still room for discussion as to how is the most effective, efficient, pragmatic uh, way to do it. Um, with regards to the question of the gentleman on whether it can be profitable for the growers, if it is indeed the case that they capture 4% of the value of the coffee, uh, I don't see why they would necessarily uh, bear 100% uh, of the cost of traceability or sustainability. Quite the opposite. I think uh, whatever the cost, uh, it should be fairly shared uh, between the consumer, the producers, and everyone uh, in between uh, on, the, on the value chain. I think that would be the logic. Now, how do we achieve that, I think, is the question. Thank you, Michael. Mario. Yes, no, just a quick comment. Uh, 
from a roasting point of view. The regulations has a fine of 5% of sales. Not profit, not the dollar, not euros, nothing. 5% of sales of the group worldwide. So, very quickly for a medium uh, roster or large, whatever it is, we are really talking about hundreds of millions dollar fine. And uh, when I want to make a joke, trying to, 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 to be hilarious on something that is unfortunately very serious, I say it's like uh, when I park the car in second line, which you cannot do it, and I normally in Italy get a fine of uh, about 37 euros, is that instead of doing that, they blow the car with all the people inside. So this is more or less <laughs> something that instead of, 30, of, 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 of a normal fine, the authorities decided to blow the car with everybody in. So to say the least, my opinion is that it's a little bit excessive as a fine. But this is the, this is the regulation. And we, by the way, again, we should imagine that we are here talking on something that, yeah, we can modify, hopefully, in some details, but the law is the law, so it's there. So from a certain point of view, it's almost ridiculous to talk about something that is not going to change, you know? But anyway, so the point is uh, from uh, uh, the starting point, from a roster point of view, considering that the fine can actually break the company, if you only get one or, and two or three or five, is not, uh, this is for every lot important. So again, just to give you an idea, company like Lavazza is importing about 2,000 lots of coffee per year. So <laughs> if we take a two or three fine, it's gone, <laughs> it's finished. We have, we are better to give the company to the European, uh, to the, the European authority. So of course, the risk analysis will tell us from a managerial point of view, with the responsibility to our shareholders, to our, to our company, we have to reduce as much as we can the risk. So how, how, how do you do that? So okay, you can play the game and say, no, don't worry, nothing will happen. First of January will be postponed, or somebody will tell us that it's a joke, or somebody will tell us that, oh, no, no, it's not 5%, it's 5 euros. Okay, 5 euros, we can afford to pay the fine. But if these things do not happen, and as a manager, my responsibility is to manage for, for, with, the, with the freedom that I can. So what is the only thing that we can do now? Is to make very quickly a risk analysis and, and the risk being the countries that will be ready or the countries that will not be ready. The growers that will be ready or the growers that will not be ready and build our plants in a fashion that we will minimize that risk. Meaning, again, that if at the end of the story only Brazil and Vietnam will be ready to, to, to in a way, to offer inf information and data that we can based on, we will have to do it. Simply because it doesn't work to take a risk of 150 million uh, euros, which is 5% of our sales, what for? for blend uh, variability, which is of course a paramount importance. Because if, the, if in the world, all of us, we drink one type of coffee only, the consumption will probably be one third or one fourth of what it is today, because the variability of taste is one of the basis of the consumption that we had, which is, by the way, always going steadily, one and a half percent, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very good market from that point of view. No, but this is also due to the fact that we can have different types of coffee, we can have the robust <laughs> type of coffee, we can have uh, the, the, the specialty coffee, we can have uh, the soluble, we can have many, many ways of drinking our, our product. And that makes an incredible richness, which will be killed simply because there is no possibility of managing this risk. The only way to manage the risk is to change plan to minimize it, or the other way around, to imagine, uh, let's say, very fan fantastic uh, solution from the point of view of making the declaration. So, okay, there are uh, 
you know, ways uh, of uh, using uh, other, uh, maybe companies based on other countries, uh, all sorts of things that will happen. And as usually in, this day, in these things, uh, you know. Very passionate uh, <laughs> intervention. Uh, you, you wanted to say something? Or? Okay, look, uh, we are about to finish, but if you allow me, I just want one minute question answered by all of them. You have a magic wand. We know there are a lot of challenges in trade. What would you use the magic wand for? But just really one thing, what would you do if you have the magic wand and you can solve a challenge of the coffee trade? It's a difficult question, but I wanted to know because we heard so many, you know, we, about the difference between one origin, diversification, the problem, okay, climate change, the changing regulatory framework. Things are becoming more complex. We understand the decision that made by roster, by, by the, by, not by the farmer, by the consumers. We, we look about traceability, we look about, you know, mechanisms to solve this that were proposed. But now you have the magic wand. What do you do, Ramesh? not working. The, his microphone it doesn't never work. <laughs> we get one. Use that one. <laughs> uh, I think the biggest problem the trade faces is with regulations. Right. Okay. So if I had a magic wand, I would remove all these uh, restrictions. You will remove the regulations? Yeah, I think it should be, see, quality is very clear. Quality is something between the producer and the buyer. It's final. The buyer sees it, he likes it, it's there. Now, in between, we have, between the grower and the roaster, we have the whole chain of regulation starting from producing country okay. right till the so end. So, he eliminates all the regulations. Yes. So, can we adapt also to drinking, driving, everything? No regulations. No, not that. <laughs> okay, you have to drive. You can't have everybody driving on the, whichever side exactly. of the road you want. You need minimum, uh, those are, by regulations, I mean trade regulations, not... Okay. Uh, now, Mario, one, let's make it a tour. We, one, we one all thing. want the objective. We started four years ago a deforestation free coffee project and activity with the, the, the government of Ecuador. So this is out of question. I don't want to discuss my attitude to, to, to that. But the point is we have to stop everything and start, unfortunately, from zero. Starting from zero means, first of all, let's talk with the, the, the coffee producer. Let's talk with the coffee user. And having very clear the objective, which I think nobody disagree, we have to find workable and effective solutions. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think build capacity and capability at the weakest level first. Coffee That's is fun. just too precious to be left to two origins. Right? Yes. If, it's, if it's two origins in the end, it's just not worth having any of these Absolutely. things. Right? Yes. So it's just too precious. We have to move beyond this bipolar world of coffee. Right? And build cap capacity and capability. Ten. <laughs> I would introduce more regulation. And the regulation I would introduce is to force all the world's roasters to, to tell to us where they're buying coffee from. Just like the manufacturer of a shirt in India when he exports to Europe, he has to say where it's made. The European roasters and the world's roasters are under no obligation to tell us where they're right. manufacturing and producing coffee from. And the day that happens, I think you'll find that the world's environmentalists will be putting pressure on roasters to diversify the origination and help so the world's this. farmers. Okay. That's one point of view. Now, Let me just let's see your magic wand. Just, uh, no, just one final comment, if, really, if, if uh, microphone works. No, I agree with everything that was said and with anything that was said. <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, basically, basically, whatever is done with more or less legislation, with more or less information, which I agree with, I agree with that. Uh, if we continue down this path, this is going to be to hit directly the small holder coffee farmer. And that's one of the biggest concerns. I don't know if, if, if you haven't had the chance to see it. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Saxon, Columbia University, made a study where he says two very interesting things. 
One is, one is the way things are going, small coffeeholder farmers are going to disappear or are going to suffer a lot. And there was a few years ago with, uh, working with the World Coffee Producers Forum. And the second thing is he proposed something that at the time, and this was presented in Brazil in 2019, uh, said, people said, you know, that's kind of crazy, this idea. To have like this global coffee fund that will be funded by the, by the industry to help farmers cope with climate change and uh, with, to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, people said, you know, this is undoable. I was very happy to hear, I think it was, it was Andrea Ili who, who said that, uh, a very similar idea. If, if one was Andrea, my apologies, but I think it was Andrea. And uh, uh, saying, you know, we need to have to fund this initiative, we need to fund uh, climate uh, mitigation uh, adaptation. And who has the funds? Traders and mostly roasters and retailers. Because farmers certainly do not have the funding, and they are the ones suffering the worst consequences. I invite you all to look at, again, the climate change patterns which happen in the tropical belt between uh, in the equator line where coffee producing countries are located. Thank you. That's so if I have a magic wand, uh, so for all the products which I am uh, selling in the market, I would like to uh, make full traceability of uh, all the materials going into it, right up to the uh, origination of the, the plantations and the smallholders, uh, with the ultimate objective that uh, we've all been talking about smallholders today, that I want to make a positive impact on the lives of the smallholders. So that's if I have a magic wand, that's the most direct impact which I would like to make. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see with Tom. Yeah, it's very close. Yeah, yeah. Just a one mic comment. Was he? Was he? Oui. En fait, je vais je vais pas. Je disais justement qu'en fait, il n'y a pas de solution magique parce que nous sommes nous-mêmes les magiciens de ce que nous faisons. Alors, parler d'une solution magique, ce serait peut-être utopique, surtout pour euh, les producteurs qui sont la, le maillon faible de la chaîne ici. Là. Il y a eu beaucoup d'intervenants aujourd'hui, beaucoup d'interventions, bien sûr, sur les différents problèmes liés à la production, à la transformation, à la commercialisation et au tout, à tous les impacts. Euh, qui affecte euh, tout l'itinéraire technique et commercial. Il y a le, bien entendu aussi le problème de la déforestation, etc. Vous savez, tous ces problèmes qui se posent actuellement sur la filière euh, font que aujourd'hui, pour, être, pour vraiment être magicien, euh, je crois qu'il faut euh, faire appel à un secours plus important, aller faire appel à Dieu. Or, nous, nous voyons ici que même Dieu est fatigué de tous ces problèmes qui se posent actuellement au niveau de, de cette population qui souffre au jour le jour de ce qu'il produit, qu'il ne consomme pas, ou ce qu'il consomme et qu'il ne produit pas. Voyez, donc, pour conclure encore à nouveau, je dis la solution, en réalité, c'est une concertation entre tous les acteurs de ces filières, de ces matières premières. Parce que s'il n'y a pas une concertation inclusive, Je pense que euh, il n'y aura pas de magie. Merci, merci, Michael Michel. Um, yeah, I, I kind of agree. I, I don't think it takes a magic wand to to fix uh, the, the current uh, challenge. I mean, if I had a white magic wand, I would like everybody to be uh, safe and healthy, yes. uh, and, and 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 that we would be protected of the worst consequences of climate change and biodiversity loss. That would be my choice. Now, if we were to solve the situation of coffee in India, in particular, I mean, talking to, to a, a, an Indian audience in, in, in large part, I think well, India is very well placed because already in India you have very strong uh, public digital infrastructures in place. So it's possible uh, with very minimal cost to identify uh, people, to connect to their phone number, to their uh, bank accounts, and to a large extent, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to imagine that you could connect it to a farm. And once you have that uh, data infrastructure in place, making it a transparent system is not rocket science. I mean, it has been done in other geographies, maybe not at that scale, but uh, I think the, the basis, the technical, technical basis of uh, making the supply chain 
more transparent, more easy to trace, and, and to attach uh, ESG performance, not only deforestation, but ESG performance to the production and trade of all commodities is, is probably the way of the future, irrespective of regulation, because that's what the consumers want. They want to be sure that they are not complicit of social or environmental harm. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the, all the participants for this very rich, interesting, complex and passionate discussion. And just to, I can quote uh, one Esteban, the only solution to go to heaven without dying is to have a cup of coffee. Do you agree? Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I request you. you to kindly stay back for a moment. Thank yeah. You. Uh, how can we leave uh, the That's esteemed the delegates way. without felicitating them? I would request the <laughs> Joint Director Research of Coffee Board, Mr. Naveen Behel Rinta Tiang, to kindly felicitate. First of all, I would request uh, Mr. Gerardo Pataconi to kindly come forward. Gerardo, kindly come forward. Sir. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. It was a very engaging session in terms of uh, keeping us totally engrossed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gerardo Pataconi. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now request Mr. Trishul Mandana, the Managing Director of uh, Wall Cafe, to kindly come forward. Thank you, Mr. Trishul, the Managing Director of uh, Wall Cafe. I would now like to call upon Mr. Yuan Esteban Ordas, President of the Colombian Coffee Federation. Mr. Esteban. Thank you, Mr. Yuan Esteban Hordas, the President of the Colombian Coffee Federation. Now I would like to call upon Mr. Mandeep Singh Tuli, the Procurement Head, Nutrition and Ice Cream, South Asia, Unilever. Thank you, Shri Mandeep Singh Tuli, for your uh, presence and uh, participation in the panel. I would now like to call upon Mr. Amit Pant, the Senior Vice President of Tata Coffee, to kindly come over. Mr. Amit Pant. Thank you, Mr. Amit Pant, the Senior Vice President of uh, Tata Coffee. I will now like to call upon Mr. Marlo Seriuti, the Chief Institutional Relations and Sustainability Officer, Lavaza Group. Mr. Ramesh Raja, the President of the Coffee Exporters Association of India. Thank you very much, Sri Ramesh Raja, for your uh, presence and participation in the panel discussion. The President of the Coffee Exporters Association of India, Bengaluru. Dr. Anselme Gautam the President of African and Madagascar Robusta Coffee Agency, ACRAM Togo, to kindly come over. Thank you, Dr. Anselme, for your presence and presentations and comments and remarks. Thank you. Dr. Michael Boki, the Councillor, Head of Section, Delegation of the European Union to India. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor.
Thank you. Now I request all the panelists to kindly come forward. Sir, be there. All of you together for a photograph with the memento, please. With the memento. You can carry the memento with you and then come for a photograph. In the meantime, please note there is one more session after this, but after that, at uh, 6 p.m. onwards, uh, there is a musical evening. The Coffee Board Government of India would uh, invite all the delegates, sponsors, and exhibitors to this musical evening. Please pass on the message. Some of you might have gone out. Please tell them that there is a musical evening at uh, 6 p.m., followed by a heartfelt thanksgiving to our sponsors. So please take a quick break for about 8 to 10 minutes and then come back so that the next session will start at uh, 4.30. Thank you very much, and all of you take care. Do come back quickly. <laughs>